Monster Warrior here. Yeah! Heavy metal is back. Oh, listen to those riffs, my friend. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm telling you. Yeah. And look, at, we got ourselves a little headbanger tadpole. Hey, dude, did you come to, like, like do some headbanging with some heavy metal, man? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can play air guitar, though. It doesn't look like you have any fingers, man. No offense. Hey, man, he's kind of cool looking, little tadpole. Yeah, you're one of those special little creatures that starts off and you get like a different name and then you turn into this cool looking frog. Very cool. Well, we're just going to shrink you a little bit there, tadpole. You look kind of big, you know, a little abnormal, I think, for a little tadpole. Anyway, hey, well, he's our little feature animal of the day. Woohoo! yeah. Look, what are we looking at? We're looking at Chapter 9. That's right. Can you believe it? Chapter 9. This chapter really came at high demand, so it's like a dedication. Well, let's get started here in doing this review. I think this is going to go really fast, okay? So it says here, since the letters on the coordinate grid represent the locations of the first four holes on a golf course. Yeah. Which of the following accurately describes the location of a hole? Notice the word accurately. All right. That means it's got to be correct. This is mark all that apply. That wonderful mark all that apply suggesting. Be careful. There may be more than one answer, you know. That's right. This is that new common core. Well, first things first here, my friends. I have to do this. I always do this. I mark my, my axes. I have two of them two axes, one axis. I have the x-axis, which is that horizontal line that goes across from left to right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I have the y-axis, which goes up and down, or I prefer vertically. All right, it's real important that we remember that. And whenever we do coordinate pairs, remember the coordinate pairs are always listed as x, y. Y, well, X comes before Y in the alphabet. No, that's not Y. They just named them that way, and now you just have to remember. And X comes before Y, so there you go. It makes it simple. All right, so X we're going to deal with first. Anyways, whole U is right here. I see it. It's four units left and four units down from whole S. Well, here's whole S. Is that true? Well, if I'm looking at whole S, and I'm thinking to myself, is a whole U four units left from uh, whole S, we have one, two, three, four, but whole S is actually four units left of whole U. But here it says whole U is four units left and four units down from whole S. So that can't be because whole U is four units right. Yeah, these are actually complete opposites because when you think about it, whole U is above it's not even down from whole s anywho let's go to the next one now it says whole f is one unit right okay and seven units down from whole u so if we're here at whole u is whole f one unit right of that uh it is one unit i can see here see where the f yes it's one unit okay so f is one unit right of whole, of, of whole U. Is it also seven units down from whole U? Well, let's see. If we did that one right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, it is. It is seven units down. Yeah, I like you, B. You work for me. <laughs> I'm a poet and didn't know it. And what do we have for C here? It says whole T is two units left uh, and four units up from whole S. Well, is it two units left? From whole, yes, it is. I see one, two, yes. And then it also says, and is it four units up from whole S? One, two, three, four. It is. Oh, my goodness, two in a row. C, yes, C, you are a winner. D says whole S is three units left and five units up from whole F. Well, S is definitely to the left of whole F. Is it? Three, one, two, three. No, it's not. Okay, it's not even five units up either, is it? No. So sorry, D. You do not get to participate. We shall move on to the next problem. All right. It says a builder is buying property to build new houses. 
the sizes of the lots are, oh my goodness, one sixth, one half, one third, one half, one sixth, one half, one half, one third, one sixth, one half, one sixth, one half, one sixth, one sixth. Oh, please, I need some more air. And one third acre. Organize the information in a line plot. Okie dokie. What is the average size of the lots? As you can see, I have my diagram that I have put here, my little line plot. I have a fraction of one-sixth of an acre. I have a fraction of one-third of an acre. And, of course, I have one-half. So I have a six here. So I'm going to go ahead and just put one little X there to represent my six. I'm going to take another one for a half. Looks like I have a half here. And if you notice, ooh, it looks like I have, an, uh, I have a one-third here. Do I try to keep track of my work? Now I have another one-third and one-sixth. Now I have my, it looks like I have six of the one-sixth acres. I have three of the one-third acres, and I have six of the one-half. Interesting in this particular problem because it's asking us for the average. In order to determine the average of a, like a set of data, which is what we have here, uh, I need to add them all up and then divide by the number of items in that, that list or within that data. And what's interesting, though, with this particular problem is we really don't even have to do that. There is a shortcut. I love shortcuts because this six here is exactly equal to six over here. Therefore, these could almost be eliminated, making one third the average. Does that make sense? Because they're exactly the same on either side. And I bet the average would be one third. But let's go ahead and solve it. Probably a good idea to solve it so that way at least you can see how this is done. Because I have six, one six, I'm going to just go ahead and multiply those. And again, this is just six over six, right? We've learned that. Multiply the numerators and, or you just think of six, one six copies of, we end up with one whole. Now with the one half, I have six of those too. Let me put the, my six here times one half, which is six over two, which is equal to three. Because six times one is six. So now I have four. Now I have three one thirds. Well, that's nice. Three one thirds, three copies of one third. Yeah, it's just three over three or another one whole. So I have one, two, plus three is five. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take my five and that's my total. I'm going to divide that by the number of items I have here. Well, I have six, six, and three. So that would mean I would 12. So I would have 15. And five holes divided by 15. So you see that five, 15 can't go into five, right? So we're going to have to put in a little decimal point there. Let's put in an added zero like so. Now 15 will go into 15. Right, three times. And that's going to be 45. Now when we subtract that, we're going to end up with 5. And so I'm going to have to put another little zero there. And that zero comes down. Good old long division. Now I have, actually have the exact same situation. How many times will 15 go into 50? Exactly the same, 3. And you can see that this pattern is going to continue. We call that a repeating decimal. And all that means is that this here is not going to ever stop. It's going to go on forever. And what we can do, though, is we can get a close approximation. So 0.3 repeating is equal to one third. So there's our answer, one third acre. Kind of a tough, I think, division problem to kind of be, to, to figure out, but we did do it. I hope that made some sense for you. Time to move on. Number three, it says for six days in a row, Julia measured the depth of the snow in a shaded area of her backyard. It says the line graph shows her data. Between which two days did the depth of the snow decrease the most? Keywords, decrease the most. Of course, and decrease means, yeah, decrease means like to make less. Okay, so we're going to be, whatever that was, it's going to make it less. So here's our depth. This is on our y-axis. Again, this is our x-axis. So on our x-axis, it represents the days, the number of days. And then on our y-axis, it represents the depth in inches. Of course, we have our title of our graph. We need to have that too, snow depth. Well, for, you can see from, from day one to day two, it's increasing. All right, so it's going from basically two inches up to maybe about three inches. We're, we need decrease though. Right, we, we're looking for when it goes down. So that's not even going to be between two and three. And it looks to me from day three to day four, it looks like it's almost like kind of flatlining there, right? It's just straight across, so there's no change. But now I see a decrease here from day four to day five. 
And then I also see a decrease here from day five to day six. The question is, what has the, the largest decrease? Where did it decrease the most? Well, day four, I would say that's 11 inches. Let's write that down. Day four is equal to 11 inches. And I'm going to do two little marks like that. That's let me know it's inches, okay, rather than spell it out. Now, from day four to day five, well, on day five, it looks like that I have eight inches. And then for day six, it looks like I have right in between two and four. I have three inches. So what do you think? You go from 11 to eight. So we find the difference to find the decrease. We end up with a difference of three inches. However, here, eight inches from day five, if we minus day six, we end up with five inches. So the largest decrease, okay, would be between day five and day six. That's kind of kind of nice, huh? Yeah, okay. Time to flip the... Whoa! Woohoo! It's Tadpole City! Yeah! Oh my goodness, they're all over the place here. Okay. I don't know. They're kind of cool looking. I like these guys. All right. <laughs> what do you guys? The Tadpoles will go marching on the Tadpoles now. Okay. Portia made a table to figure out how much she earned selling t-shirts. Day one, looks like she sold five. She made $20. Okay. Day two, okay, I see 10. I see a pattern here. Double, double, double. Here, three. Ooh, not double, but times one or times two times three times four, right, by the number of days. Same here, 20, 40, 60, 80. Again, wow. So we're increasing by five each time. And here it looks like we're increasing by 20 each time. All right. So for numbers 4A through 4B, use the table to choose the correct values to describe how one sequence is related to the other. All right. The unknown number in day five is, hmm, 20, 40, 60, 80. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need to spend too much time with that one. I think you get that. The rule that describes how the number of t-shirts sold relates to the amount earned is, all right, let's take a look here. We'll go back to our table. The rule that describes how the number of t-shirts sold relates to the amount earned. You can see here's five, and then we have 20, then we have 10, and then we have 40, we have 15, and we have 60. Yeah, did you see the pattern? Definitely multiply it by four. That's the pattern because five times four is 20, 10 times four is 40, and you get the, the rest of that. That's what we call the rule, like the function rule sometimes. Okay, Jawan, Juan, I think it's Jawan, made a table to figure out how much he earns at his job, his job earnings. Week one, two, three, four, assuming that's week five, hours worked and amount earned. Okay, we've got a question mark here. Oh, the dot, dot, dot. Yeah, okay, that would refer to the fact that this is going to continue on. Now, it says write a rule that relates the amount Jawan earns to the number of hours worked. Explain how you can check your rule. All right, well, looking at this here, the number of hours here, he, he worked uh, six hours on uh, week one, and he, he made $54. Well, what pattern would I have that's going to get me from six to 54? Well, six times nine would equal 54. How about over here? Does 12... Would 12 times 9 equal 108? I do believe it does. And then the numbers get larger. We could even check this one right here. Does 18 times 9 equal 162? Well, that's 72. Carry the 7. 9 plus 7 is 16. Yeah, that is a winner. So write the rule and explain how we can check your rule. And I think I already showed that. So let me go ahead and write some words down for you. And there we go. The rule is to multiply by 9. We could check it by doing each one of those on the table. And sure enough, the product will equal the amount earned in that table when we multiply the hours worked by 9. Okay, in part B, it says, how much does he earn from his job in week 6? Okay, well, let's look up above. Okay, I can see week 6 is right on this one here. It says that he worked 36 hours. And now that we know that we can multiply by 9, which, again, is the amount of money he's going to make per hour. 
So we're just going to take 36 and multiply it by 9. Remember, 6 times 9 is 54. We put our 4 down here and we carry the 5 up. The 5 will be added. Then we have 9 times 3, which is 27. Okay, and we take that 27 plus 5, okay, which is going to give us 32. And that's money because that $9, believe it or not, was actually money. So we're going to end up with $324. And that's it, my friends. Yo, yo. Man, these videos, they just, they go so fast. But, you know, it's probably a good thing. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's that music in the background? Farmer in the Dell. Oh, you're kidding me. Hey. Who did that to my audio? Yousef, what happened to my heavy metal music? I'm really sorry, Mr. Wara. I really don't know what happened. I was fixing it and something really strange happened to the track. It just didn't go through correctly. Please give me a second. I'll take care of it for you. Yeah, Yousef, please. This is embarrassing. Come on. This is in the video, my friend. Bring my heavy metal music back. Okay, Mr. White, please just give me a second. I'm getting it out right now. It'll only take a second, okay? Hang on, hang on. I almost got it. Okay, here it is. There we go. Oh, my life is bad. Hey, <laughs> well, thank you, my friends, for another video and another clean ending. <clears throat>